so, uh, so good evening, everyone, and, and thank you all so much for, uh, for being here. My name's uh, Peter Slavin. I'm president of uh, Mass General Hospital, and it's really a wonderful pleasure for me to welcome you to the Paul Russell Museum of Medical History and Innovation and uh, to this special event uh, celebrating the uh, 25th anniversary of the Mass General uh, Cancer Center. We are uh, delighted to have really a wonderful uh, speaker with us uh, this evening, Mike Milken, who will be hearing from in a few minutes. During the 25-year history of the Cancer Center, uh, it has experienced uh, tremendous growth, both clinically as well as on the impact that it's having on this field through its research. Uh, with really an exceptional record of discovery, the Cancer Center has become an international leader in the field of personalized, uh, scientifically driven uh, cancer therapies. It's a pioneer in diagnostic nanotechnology, genetically targeted uh, cancer therapies, innovative uh, radiation therapy, and advanced uh, surgical techniques. And these advances, in many cases, were facilitated by the generous support of donors uh, to our cancer center. Without philanthropic support, many of the things that are now being used routinely in our cancer center would never have happened or would have taken a lot longer. And so we are very grateful for our uh, donors for, uh, for helping us advance the fight against cancer. Turning uh, to uh, why you're here tonight, uh, not only to celebrate our Cancer Center's 25th anniversary, but to hear from our guest speaker, clearly one of the great fighters in our country uh, against cancer, particularly prostate cancer, is the celebrated uh, financier and philanthropist Mike Milken. Mike founded the Prostate Cancer Foundation, and in so doing, he effectively brought cancer, prostate cancer uh, out of the, uh, the medical wilderness. He has long been one of the world's uh, true innovators, both as a philanthropist and in finance. Esquire listed him among the most influential people of the 21st century. Starting on Wall Street in 1969, he financed the growth of 3,200 companies that created millions of jobs, and his uh, philanthropy began in the 70s and paralleled his business career, expanding in 1982 with the establishment of the Milken Family Foundation, whose medical research awards have supported development of several medical breakthroughs. And he's also, uh, through the uh, Milken Family Foundation, long been a generous supporter of Mass General through his uh, various foundations. But Mike does far more than just write checks to support cancer research. He becomes very deeply involved. And among his many uh, medical initiatives, Mike founded uh, Faster Cures, an action tank that removes barriers to progress against all life-threatening diseases. And a Fortune magazine cover called him the man who changed medicine. Mike also chairs the Milken Institute, and the Institute hosts a global conference that brings together 3,500 leaders from more than 50 nations to Los Angeles each spring. And you can read more about the Milken Institute and the incredible number of things that Mike is involved in uh, through the web, at, uh, and the URL is mikemilken.com. So we, are, uh, thrilled to ha we were thrilled when Mike accepted our invitation to come uh, meet with a select uh, group of our leaders and supporters uh, uh, on the occasion of the uh, 25th anniversary of our Cancer Center. His uh, topic this evening will be accelerating medical solutions. And so uh, please help me extend a very warm MGH welcome to Mike Milken. Thank you. Well, it's great to be with you tonight. It's also great to make it to the 21st century. So, uh, and it's always great to be at Mass General. And I have very good memories of being here. My first visits were 40 years ago. And so it's been a long journey for me and for many of you. So I thought I'd start just thinking about talking to some of you today with Mr. Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was an age of wisdom. It's the age of foolishness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. And so this is the golden age of science and of medicine. And the potentials today are so great that it's hard to believe that these aren't the best of times. On the other hand, if you're focusing on the National Institute of Health, uh, they are cutting funding. They've had their budgets effectively cut through inflation and now sequester. And in our Faster Curves group, as we travel around the country, we've been very successful in our work in China and India, uh, UK, 
Japan on convincing them that the future for any country is their commitment to the biosciences. Unfortunately, in the United States, we've been a little more confused recently. Uh, and so for some people, some people think it's the worst of times. And it is very, very difficult time, particularly for young scientists who've had their, their funding cut far more than anyone else. I am here today for a number of reasons, the 25th anniversary, but really to say thank you for what you've chosen and where you work, most of you, in that every life is precious and uh, we sometimes forget how precious. We have to be reminded periodically, but on an economic basis, and I'm going to talk a lot about economics tonight, 50% of all economic growth in the world for the last 200 years are due to advances in health. And if any of you saw or, or ever looked at Bob Fogel's work, Bob recently passed away, he was a good friend, a Nobel Prize winner, he has this, these charts and everything on 11,000 years of human history. And when you look at those charts, you can see there was no growth in the population for a thousand years during periods of time. There was no growth in per capita income for a thousand years. And most everything that's happened has happened in the last couple hundred years. And I was a little disappointed not to see high yield bonds on, on Bob's chart there. <laughs> but if you look at the chart, you will see whether it's penicillin or all these breakthroughs that have occurred in the last 200 years that have changed the world as we know it. And maybe one of the simplest ways I can present this to you is take a look at what's happened in East Asia in two generations. Life expectancy was 43 years of age. Today, it's over 75, a 70% increase in a couple generations. And if you think just how would you react, how would a family react, when you have life expectancy in your early 40s, you're not really planning that much for the future. It's hard to pass knowledge down from one generation to another. But giving an opportunity <clears throat> potentially for four generations, four generations to interact, what an amazing thing. Had you known that, I'm sure you would have all invested in Southeast Asia uh, because the revenue grew because the people live longer and healthier lives. Let's go to this century. In this century, six or seven of the fastest growing economies in the world are in Sub-Sahara Africa. So it isn't too hard to figure out what's happening in Sub-Sahara Africa either. A woman used to have a 90% probability of passing AIDS on to her children. You have countries where AIDS was in 30% of the adult population. Today, you have a probability as low as 2% in passing AIDS on to your children. AIDS, for many of them, has become a chronic disease, living longer, healthier lives, the children not having AIDS. An entire revolution is occurring due to better health and wellness from that standpoint. And when you step back and think about the United States, you know, all the foreign aid the United States has ever given, all the military equipment, pales in comparison to what's happened in South Asia, Southeast Asia, parts of Latin America, and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, due to things that many of you might have worked on in your lifetime. So today I thought I'd talk about three things. The interaction of financial capital and technology with accelerating medical solutions, bioscience, and public health, and where have we come from, and where are we going? So, in 1965, after the Watts riots, I scribbled down this formula, and I've told Howard Sewell, who visits you generally monthly, that I'm so disappointed it wasn't up on the walls when I arrived in Math. And Matthew Smith, I expect, when well, next time I visit you, to see it on your walls. But I wrote this formula down really to say that access to capital, financial capital, had a multiplier effect on the world's largest asset, human capital. Gary Becker won a Nobel Prize in 92 for pointing out that human capital made 
up 75% or more of what the real assets were of a country, a city, or region. Social capital, the second largest assets, and those things that you see, cash, factories, roads, and such, make up a very small part of the real assets of a country. And so the question we had beginning in the 1960s, and I switched my major from math and physics to business, was how do we get capital in the hands of people who have ability? And I want to stress this to you because over the next five years particularly, you're going to see new financial structures for financing the life sciences, medical research created. And this is what we focused on in the early 1970s. And by 1974, when really modern financial markets were created, by getting capital in the hands of people with ability, you revolutionize what was going on in the United States. And by the early 1980s, when financial markets were totally open, you can see this dramatic change that occurred with non-investment grade companies and small and medium businesses creating 62 million jobs in the private sector in the next 30 years and large companies creating minus 4 million jobs. It's amazing what you can do when you get the, hand, the money into the hands of people with ability whether they're a scientist or whether they're running a business. Part of the effort was to diversify and democratize the access to capital. And today there's tens of thousands. That little blue line you see there is the percentage of loans that are actually owned by banks. So if you went to 1994, you see all they still owned almost 80% of all loans. Today they own about 10% of all loans. And in the 1980s, as this was going on, the country grew even though our banks shrunk. This democratization of capital really changed the flow of capital, and 10 or 20 people could not decide who got money. At one time, the United States, Japan, and Europe made up 80% of the world's economy. They then went to 60% of the world's economy uh, in 2005, and today, the emerging parts of the world make up more than 50% of the world's economy. It's crossed over this year. And I really want to stress this to you when you're thinking about where you're going to get funding from, who you're going to interact with on a financial basis. Okay, there's dramatic change. Now, if I took you back to 1820, the two largest economies in the world were India and China. They made up almost 45% of the world's economy. But starting in the late 1800s, uh, we had a dramatic change, particularly in Northern Europe. But you're seeing that reversal today as to who has wealth, who's growing, and it was always shifting to the rest of the world's economies. The other thing when you think about it, and you're focused on the NIH, but if really focused on what's going on, if you look at companies, companies in the United States have more cash than at any other time in the history of the world. Yes, it's obvious that Apple we read about all the time, has actually today over $150 billion in cash. But Microsoft has over 70, and Google has over 60 today, and Cisco has over 50. And the major pharmaceutical companies have the most liquidity and the lowest cost of capital they've had in, in any point in history. So when you're looking for capital today, the question is, all these corporations what is the opportunity for them to see life sciences, bioscience, and their future in their business? If we look at around the world today, it is even more dramatic than the United States. The large companies in China have the equivalent of 40% of the entire GDP of China in cash. If you go to the UK, it's 37%. Japan, it's over 25% today. France, it's around 23 to 24%. So this liquidity not only exists in companies in the United States, this liquidity exists today in companies all over the world. Let's spend a minute on Japan. Japan has had a very difficult period of time here, which now spans almost 35 years. They had amazing growth peaking in 1988, and then for the last 25 years, they've been under essentially some form of recession. Today, it's a different story. 
Japanese companies have more cash than ever before in history. Interest rates in Japan are as low as possible, and the people, the citizens of Japan today, have more cash than any citizens in the world. 55% of the net worth of everyone in Japan is in cash, one in short a year, and they're yielding essentially nothing. They've made the decision, instead of investing, they'd rather get zero rate of return on their money than lose their money. The current government in Japan, however, has taken a different approach. Japan's corporate cash exceeds the entire GDP of Spain, for example, as does the United States. And the leadership in Japan over the last six months has identified bioscience, life science, as potential growth area for the future of Japan. They've come under pressure, as we all know, from Samsung and Apple and others in electronics. Their currency has been relatively strong, once 360 to the dollar, now 100. And they are looking at their patents and their ability to move into the biosciences today. They would be phenomenal partners for anyone in the world today, whether it's at the federal level or whether it's the corporate level. And many of you, I'm assuming, are familiar with the story of Fiji, Fuji film, excuse me, where they, like Kodak, essentially went out of the business but discovered they have all these patents and now have redefined themselves as a life science company. So it isn't just the corporations that have this enormous liquidity or their citizens, the sovereign funds that have grown over the past decade. A country like Norway, sovereign fund increased by more than twice the funding of the NIH in the last year. Five million people live in Norway. They set up this fund as the North Sea Fund, a rainy day fund, in case something went wrong in the country. Their goal, 500 million. They've overshot that goal by a little bit. They've now reached 810 billion. So we've spent a great deal of time with them discussing two factors. Having an allocation of the fund, as much as 5%, which would be 40 billion, invested in the for-profit life sciences, and having up to 3% of the fund, 25 billion a year, being spent in basic and translational research as part of their foreign policy. The point of this slide is to tell you whereas the United States has a great deal of debt and a lot of unfungent obligations. There are countries like Abu Dhabi that has one million citizens, one million citizens, three million expats that have in excess of 800 billion today. Singapore, Kuwait, none of these countries can ever spend the money in their country. After the enormous inflation of Japan in the late 1980s, countries like Singapore passed a law that their <clears throat> government investment corp, GIC, could not invest in Singapore. Singapore's economy is too small relative to the size of their funds and would dramatically cause inflation. It isn't just the sovereign funds, it isn't just the corporations around the world. It is also what's occurred in the last five, four to five years. The stock market in the United States has increased by $10 trillion. Indirectly and directly, that touches citizens in this country. Outside the United States, various markets have also increased by $10 trillion. And lastly, the life science indices in the market. And investment lags these. But the best performing part of the stock market this year is life sciences. If you invested in Fidelity's biotech fund, you're up more than 100% in 2013. Fidelity is the largest investor in biotech in the world through all their funds today. You can see here a point I want to make to you that's extremely important, and that is the spike in that little orange line in 1999, the same as the spike that occurred in the Internet bubble and NASDAQ. And it was this dramatic drop in this period of time between 99 and the early part of this century that turned investors off to investing in the life sciences. The fact that you lost 80% of your money over this period of time, it has taken almost a decade for this to come back. But the opportunity today is that investors will start coming back just due to the outperformance. And you can see, had you stayed the course, 
in this period of time between 1998 and today, you would have seen the best part of your portfolio was in the biosciences. However, if you had invested in 99, you can see you had zero rate of return for a decade. And so it takes a while. I'd like to talk to you now about one of the reasons why the federal government is not funding the life sciences to a higher rate and why it's affected you dramatically over the past few years. And hopefully, it's about to change. And that is residential housing in America. This is a look at what we estimate that estimate that what the subsidies come from the federal government from subsidizing residential housing in America. Now, how do they subsidize residential housing? One, people can take a mortgage out non-recourse, which means you're allowed to default on that mortgage. 55% of Americans today believe it is okay not to make their mortgage payment. 55%. Next, you don't have to provide call protection, which means if you want to borrow for 30 years, you can pay it off any time you want. When Apple, a company that has $10 in cash for every dollar in debt wants to borrow, they have to give you call protection. When the United States government wants to borrow, they have to give you call protection. There isn't any investor in the sophisticated investor in the world that would buy a US government bond for 30 years or a corporate bond without call protection. Next, if you remember, the federal government offered you a first time home buyer credit. So even if you couldn't have afforded a house, they gave you money and then they loaned you all the additional money, non-recourse. So we've estimated these subsidies range between two to $300 billion a year. The federal government invests less than 100 million in education and obviously far less than that in medical research. So in 1980, when this program really started in earnest by the federal government, the federal government was guaranteeing 13 billion in residential mortgages and 7% of all mortgages touch the US government agencies. By 2013, 33 years later, the federal government is directly or indirectly guaranteeing $6 trillion in residential mortgages. And 90% of every mortgage, 90% of every mortgage uh, touches some government agency. When they could no longer loan money through Fannie Mae and Jenny Mae, since the government effectively seized them, they used FHA to continue to make these mortgages in 2008 2009, 2010, 2011, and continued today. So we stepped back and said hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars that's been diverted from other areas such as education and bioscience, that the federal government felt it was more important that you buy a house that was bigger than focused on the education of your children or the health of the populace, what were the benefits? There must be tremendous benefits from this government program. So we looked at home ownership in America in 1980 before this started. Home ownership was 65.6%. So we said, well, what's happened 33 years later? Well, home ownership is 65.4%. So there's been absolutely no benefit from the hundreds of billions of dollars that have been diverted. In fact, when you look at home ownership around the world, many of the other countries have higher rates of home ownership in the United States that don't offer these services. And if you remember, Canada's had no financial problems in their banking system. They don't guarantee these residential mortgages, nor does Denmark. And countries like Germany and Switzerland, who have substantially better financing in the United States, Neither of them have high levels of home ownership. Switzerland, in fact, is 40%. Those aren't federal policies in those countries. So then we said, okay, how's the investment doing? You know, I remember on a cable channel, they told you the price of homes only went up. So who could get hurt buying a home? Well, a man just won a Nobel Prize, Mr. Schindler, who just graphed and the interesting thing about finance is you can almost say anything and someone might believe you. In your field, you would actually don't get drugs approved until you have data. 
So here's the data. In the last 122 years, the price of a home in America has gone up 61 years and gone down 61 years. Okay, It's not the world's greatest investment. The best investment was that you were able to leverage it with government support, but even then, you lost substantial money in half the years. So we said, what about transaction costs? You remember when you used to have to go to a, a bank to make a deposit or to write a check? They've reduced transaction costs in the financial world by 99%. So if you had $200,000 worth of Apple stock and you wanted to sell it, it would cost you $9.99 and take approximately one second. Okay, now you have a house for $200,000. What have we done? Well, your realtor still wants 5 to 6%. Furthermore, they told you if you wanted to sell that house, you better paint the front door, get the grass working, fix the toilet, etc. So it costs about 10%. And it's the transaction costs that really have hurt. So this enormous investment by our country in diversion of assets away from things like funding bioscience towards homes, it must have therefore increased the net worth of Americans. No, it decreased the net worth of Americans. So the median net worth today in America is $45,000. Half the adults in America have a net worth under 45,000. That compares with 55,000 in Greece, so we've heard that Greece has had some problems, but the median net worth in Greece is 25% higher than the United States. Or Italy, Italy's more than 100% higher. But more than anything, it has devastated large parts of the middle class and the lower middle class. And today, 30.7% of adult Americans have a net worth under $10,000. It is estimated today that 40% of Americans, if they needed to, could not raise $2,000 in 30 days. Ask yourself, what would life be? What would your actions be if your net worth was under $10,000? So unfortunately, these policies that have diverted funds and continue to divert funds from life science and other areas have not benefited Americans. What has changed? We only found one thing that was positive, the size of the home. So as the size of the family decreased by 15% between 1980 and 2013, Americans were able to buy a larger home through all this leverage, farther away from they live, a half hour approximately, one hour additional commute, needing to burn more natural resources. If we compare this with Asia, the largest level of middle class home square footage is Singapore at 1,200. Hong Kong for a family of four or five is approximately 500 square feet. Japan, six or seven, and for all of Asia, it is 950 square feet. So Americans are larger, we all know, but they don't have to be that large today. And lastly, probably the most devastating thing these policies have done to the United States in the last 33 years is confused the middle class family as to what is important. In 11 Asian countries, the number one expenditure of the middle class is food, 23%. The number two expenditure is the tutoring of their children, supplemental education. In 11 Asian countries, the middle class spends as much on tutoring of their children as they do on their house and transportation. In the United States, due to these, quote, incentives of our government and investment by the government, the middle class spends one-third, 33% of its income on a house, 18% on transportation. More than 50% of the income of a middle class family is now spent on their transportation and on their house, 25 times what they spend on the tutoring or supplemental education of their child. It is very hard to compete in the long run where 60% of the children in the world live in a culture where their parents have decided the most important thing in the future is the education of their children versus a culture where the value of your car is nine times 
as important as the tutoring and education of your children. And the house and the car is 25 times as important. And so these incentives have diverted substantial money from bioscience and life science, but at the same time done substantial damage to the middle and lower middle class in our country. What's available to you today? Access. There are 7.3 billion mobile phones on the planet. There are more mobile phones than people on the planet. And this just isn't the two in the United States. In Africa, in the year 2000, 2% 2 of the people in Africa had a mobile phone. In 2012, 78% of the people in Africa have a mobile phone, and it's estimated now you'll be at the 84% level by 2015. And as many of you know, in 2010, mobile phones or cell phone use to look up health information was one and basically six. In two years, it's gone from one in six to 31% of people use their mobile devices to search for health information. It is now projected that there were 44 million healthcare app downloads in 12 and projected to have 124, 142 million apps by 2016. So access to anyone on the planet for the collection or dissemination of data is with us today. To if you need any more reinforcing, in the country of Zimbabwe, 35% of the people in Zimbabwe have smartphones where they get the news, information, etc., so they don't have to listen to what their government is telling them at this time. How can you use these devices? Well, let's talk about one of the disasters that occurred in America in 2010. The Deep Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, 53,000 gallons a day, it took five months to cap the well. Not only BP worked on this, Exxon, Shell, Chevron, Total, everyone weighed in to see if you could create technology to cap this well. The United States government, the Department of Energy, Nobel Prize winner Stephen Chu, every single group worked and it took them five months. When it was over, people said, you know, with mobile phones, why don't we just try crowdsourcing? crowdsourcing. Why don't we see if someone else has a better idea? They created a prize of 1.4 million. A lot of people competed. Seven teams exceeded what all the major oil companies and governments could do. Now, one of those teams was headed by Fred. Now, who's Fred who headed one of those teams? Well, Fred has a tattoo parlor in Las Vegas. Now, Ted doesn't know anything about drilling for oil. He doesn't know anything about oil spills, but he became one of the world's leading experts in getting tattoos off your body. And the point I want to make to you here is you don't know who could solve your problem. If you give the world a chance, you'd be surprised who responds. And so let's talk about one in healthcare, a lot closer to Mass General. One of the trustees of our Faster Cures organization, Dick Merkin, who takes care of the lives of a million people, decided he saw what Netflix did where they went out on the web for algorithms to run their business. So he thought, well, why don't we put out a challenge? He offered $3 million to try to have you tell him which one of his patients would be in the hospital in the next year. He could substantially reduce cost and improve the quality of life. There were 1,385 teams around the world that signed up to compete. He gave you the data on 100,000 people, their entire medical history. No one had any idea who they were. There were 23,000 entries and 39,000 participants from 39 countries, 50% of which never worked in the healthcare field. When the results came in, he developed new algorithms which substantially reduced his cost and provided better care to his patients by early identification based on past history of who might be in the hospital the next day. Bioscience and public health. 
As you know, there's three parts of this equation, prevention, treatment, and research. So let's start with prevention and wellness, and, and why not start? Okay, we estimate that 70% of all health care costs are linked to your lifestyle. Therefore, we feel you only can blame 30% of it on your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, etc. You have to take responsibility. Today, we're talking about one and three quarter trillion a year. And even more than that, it is diverting your resources to take care of patients who substantially increase their chance of cancer, diabetes, depression, and other factors because they gain weight. Now, this was not a problem in America in 1991. Only four states in America had obesity levels above 15%. Louisiana, Mississippi, West Virginia, and Michigan. In 10 years, every state but Colorado fell. Every state in the United States had obesity levels above 15%. And unfortunately, Colorado bit the dust in 2002. And so one of the things we, this is a look at 2013 in America. Every state is over 20%. Numerous states are over 30%. And so the weight factor in America has changed dramatically. We had a recent study, eating too much has overtaken undernutrition as the leading risk factor for illness. When I was at school at Berkeley, Earth Day, they told us, Ehrlich from Stanford, that everyone was going to starve. A hundred million people were going to starve. Well, you kind of missed that prediction. Let's take a look at another study, maybe even more concerning, from Columbia University. 18.2% of all premature deaths in the United States are now associated with excess body mass. So I put out two cookbooks. I've spent 20 years traveling, trying to focus on nutrition and eating and these issues, and we haven't made any real progress. Now, Matthew Smith would tell me it could be far worse if it wasn't for our efforts and his efforts, but here's a look at the California State Fair. In case you didn't get a chance to meet it, they introduced these new foods for the next year, the California State Fair. So, yes, the deep-fried butter caught my eye, you know. <laughs> you say to yourself, you know, I'm just tired of eating that quarter of a pound of butter going to the refrigerator. So now you can get a deep-fried if it really made you feel better. The chocolate-covered corn dogs, just corn dogs weren't enough. They have to be covered in chocolate now. Bacon, you know, I'm just tired of eating those 400 pieces of bacon a day. You now have chocolate-covered bacon. But my favorite of all the new products was the garlic butter bacon fries. You know, I always wondered as a young boy, what happens to the bacon grease? We now know. Okay. The new product, they cook the French fries in refried bacon grease. So you save it. You then cook your French fries in them. They, of course, taste much better. Or the beer battered, but... You know, a lot of people have been leaving California for Texas due to the high state taxes we have. So this year we sent our photographer and our expert to the Texas State Fair, which just ended two weeks ago. These were some of the offerings of new foods being introduced at the Texas State Fair. And we have a short 15 second video for you here of the winner. Here's the winner if you can figure it out, this year at the Texas State Fair. Well, we, we talk about it and think about it all year, getting ready for the competition, all kinds of crazy ideas. It's got ooey gooey goodness inside of it. Well, it's fried Thanksgiving dinner. It's everything that you would have in a Thanksgiving dinner in a deep fried ball. Deep fried Nutella. The Texas Fried Fireball. Deep fried Cuban roll. And this is our love letter to the State Fair of Texas. State Fair of Texas, to Big Tech, to the State of Texas. So if you didn't notice, 
the new winner, and I wanted you to know before Thanksgiving, because they were able to wrap an entire Thanksgiving dinner, your turkey, your gravy, your stuffing, vegetables, applesauce, inside of a dough and fry it. So you now can kiss off cutting the turkey. All you have to do is get it in one bite, okay? Your entire turkey dinner. That was the winner this year. So you can see the enormous progress we're making in America. Now, I was watching with great interest who took the elevator and who walked up the steps. And I want you to know, I was quite impressed that it looks like more than 85% of you walked up the steps. Now, why was I impressed? Here's a look at Southern California gyms. <laughs> so there's no reason to walk to the gym anymore. Unfortunately, the U.S. has been exporting its problem, and the Milken Institute recently put out a report called The Wastelines of the World and, and what's going on there. And we've been trying to figure out, okay, after all these years, 20 years of trying to change what's going on in America, the U.S. is still the most obese country in the world. And why have we not been successful? Well... I was walking around here in Boston not long ago and I saw this poster. It's from a different period of time. And more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And we began to discover for most of the middle of the 20th century and into the 1960s and 70s, the number one endorser of cigarettes was doctors. So if your doctors are smoking, and they never took a course on nutrition when they went to medical school. How can we spec the population? So they were disappointed because they lost income here because, as you know, you had to take cigarettes ads off the air. So I want to show you one of the Dr. Cigarettes ads that's in our archive here. You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you'd find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. In a repeated national survey, doctors in all branches of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to camels for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment? See how camels agree with your throat. See how mild and good tasting a cigarette can be. So we're still working. And why are we working? We estimate just the change in weight in America cost the U.S. $1 trillion a year. So housing has diverted funds from the life sciences and the biosciences, and obesity has dramatically changed, having to take care of patients, having to change things to the tune of $1 trillion. The amazing thing for me in looking at these reports was the number one cost was not diabetes, the number one cost was not cancer of these chronic diseases, the number one cost was depression. Absenteeism, presenteeism, et cetera, and medical costs. So over the years, we've tried to change the course of history. In 1995, we had the first ever National Cancer Summit. In 1998, we put on the march, which some of you joined us at, which kind of culminated the effort of thousands of people, leaders in the House and the Senate, to double the NIH budget, triple the NCI budget, and triple the National uh, Science Foundation budget. And the incremental change from what President Clinton signed into law in 1998 was $200 billion. Faster Cures was separated and it was created at that time, it spun off from something we called Camp Cure, and its efforts were to shorten the time to find cures and better treatments for all life-threatening diseases. 
We work very hard to create, and I was quizzed on it today by some of you, the National Cancer for Advancing Translational Research, obviously NCATS, headed by Chris Austin, because we felt we needed to move into the 21st century of moving quickly between basic translational and clinical research. With the difficulties in this budget, before sequestering and the fact that it was not increased and in real terms decreased substantially, we felt we needed to, to put on another event somewhere to the march. And so in 2012, and a few of you joined us, we put on the celebration of science at the NIH and the Kennedy Center and at George Washington University to reaffirm and validate the career choices of those that worked in the sciences and technology and engineering, those STEM degrees, and to discuss with our federal government, our leaders in the House, the Senate, and the administration, the fact that what our position was in bioscience as a country was going to determine what role the United States played in this century. Our partnering for cures efforts, which concluded on Monday and Tuesday, bring together six distinct groups, the academic research centers, the government agencies and government leaders, nonprofits, biotech, pharma, medical device, investors, and most importantly, disease-specific organizations, which we believe are going to be playing a much more important role in the future in driving medical research. Our trained program, we had 199 disease-specific groups where we try to strengthen these research organizations so that they can do better work in their specific dis disease category. Yes, there's challenges, but we cannot forget where we've come from. As I looked at the museum downstairs today, it reminded me that in 1900, one in five Americans lost their life by their fifth birthday. The amazing success of the field that many of you have chosen as your career, created maybe the greatest thing in the history of the world, a doubling of life expectancy on this planet in 100 years, from 31 to over 60 years and today over 70. What caused this to happen? Improved sanitation, development of antibiotics, progress against heart disease, investment in bioscience. We've eliminated in this country, due to your work and the people that worked in your field, many diseases. There were many of them the major cause of death 100 years ago. For me and my generation, beginning in the 1950s, there was this extreme fear of polio. No one was immune. It was not necessarily safe to go visit your friend or interact. Who knew how you got polio? And who knew had polio? The United States launched a program to begin the building of iron lung hotels, projected to cost billions of dollars to extend the life of polio patients before they could start construction of all those hotels. And this grand plan, on April 12, 1955, the Salk vaccine was declared safe and effective and potent and polio was conquered. But as you know full well, just because you have something that works doesn't mean anyone is going to take it. So you might remember the United States government got the most popular person in the country to go on television to get his polio shot so it would be OK for the citizens. And Elvis Presley, in 1956, publicly took his polio vaccination. Since 1955, it is estimated that $1 trillion has been saved and over 160,000 deaths prevented by this effort. And as you know, the last polio case in the United States occurred in 1962. In more recent times, a young woman, Elizabeth Glazer, focused the attention of the country on pediatric AIDS. She got HIV and AIDS from a blood transfusion, and it was passed on to her daughter, Ariel. In the 1980s, we teamed up with Elizabeth Glazer and the pediat 
Patrick Aids with many others. Her son's there in that little striped shirt, and he's alive today. He also received AIDS and HIV through his mom. And so when you think about what the world was in America in the latter part of the 1980s, I think of Oprah Winfrey going on television in 1987. Hello, everybody. AIDS has both sexes running scared. Research studies now project that one in five, listen to me, hard to believe, one in five heterosexuals could be dead from AIDS at the end of the next three years. That's by 1990. One in five. So you can imagine why there was concern in America, wanting your kids to go to school, kids with AIDS not going to school, a co-worker, etc. The leading talk show host in America told us there was a chance that one in five Americans would die in three years from AIDS. In 1991, the world was shocked again. Because of uh, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers uh, today. The day that I heard about magic, it just sort of changed my love for basketball. It shook me up. You know, you get, a, you get that feeling. Probably the same type of feeling I had when my father died. Cause me to tell. You can almost hear both of us with some uh, tears in our eyes. And I'm choked up because he did call me. And when something happens, you and then you find out who really your friends are and people who really care about you last year in our celebration of science a magic johnson alive and healthy and well with a smile bigger 22 years after that video reminded us all of the work of bioscience and the advances that we've had. We are entering this golden age. And as I've traveled around the world in the last month or two, the things I've seen in precision science or in immunology make me feel that we are in the dawn of a new age and the excitement has never been better in the 40 years that I have tried to finance and drive medical research. We're all aware that the first sequencing of the human genome took 13 years and more than $3 billion. Today, it's $1,000 in a few hours. And earlier today in Boston, we met with a group who told us they're going to do it for $100. 3D printing is alive and well today with the potential to replicate human body parts. And as you think back on your own career and when you started in the bioscience and I think back in those days at Berkeley when I was studying new models of finance, just the excitement and the anticipation of what something would be. And I want to show you that anticipation and excitement has not been lost. A young man named Jack Andreka here who won an Intel Science Award. And just think about yourself when you were his age. The winner of the $75,000 2012 Award E. Moore Award in the category of Medicine and Sciences. Maybe if we caught it earlier. That's what the doctor said about my uncle's pancreatic cancer. Like that was even possible with the testing they had. But what did I know? I was too young to understand things like cancer or how to test for it. Too young to be taken seriously. One hundred and ninety-nine experts told me I was too young. 
that they didn't have time for my little science fair project. But the way I saw it, if the key was early detection, maybe someone just needed to start looking earlier. Like during fifth period freshman biology. inspired by our young scientists and I, we are dedicated to making sure they get funded. It was 1972 when my mother-in-law Helen was diagnosed with breast cancer. We found a solution for breast cancer but 12 years later she died from multiple myeloma. I visited Boston in 1973 and 4 searching for a solution for my father's melanoma unsuccessfully. And in 93, I was diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer, and I went to visit with the president of the American Urologic Association with my wife, Lori. After he looked at my records, he told me that I don't really need a doctor. We should get our affairs in order, and I should probably hire a psychologist and a psychiatrist for our kids and our family. I mentioned to him that I, maybe I just want to try one or two things first before we go the psychiatrist route. <laughs> because of you and your dedication, okay, I am no different than any other cancer patient. When you're diagnosed, you wonder, are you going to see your kids grow up? Are you going to see them get married? Are you going to see grandchildren in your lifetime? Are you going to celebrate Halloween with them? Are you going to go to the ballpark as you travel around the country going to games to raise money for cancer research? I appreciate the dedication to you in the life sciences. I promise you that the golden age of life sciences is in front of us and together we'll create a legacy that relegates cancer and other life-threatening diseases to our children's history books. Thank you for letting me join you tonight. Thank you very much, Mike, for the very, very powerful presentation. As, as scientists and as clinicians, we're typically very focused on very specific issues that we face. And it's profoundly enlightening and slightly worrisome to see the bigger picture that you paint and the larger geopolitical trends, and of which we're a relatively small part. But thank you very much for, again, a fantastic talk. At Mass General, we see our roles as being a key engine for innovation in medicine as setting standards for clinical medicine ranging from the local communities that we serve to the global community with increasing attention to the very cost of healthcare. And finally, we see our roles in educating the next generation of physicians and scientists who lead the way. We've come a long way since 1988, 25 years ago, when the trustees of the hospital established a cancer center with the stated goal of bringing together clinical and research efforts within a world-class hospital to help fight cancer. And during these years, the Prostate Cancer Foundation, created by Mike, has supported young physician scientists here at MGH, many of whom are here today. It supported the work of Matt Smith, who you mentioned a few times, for his work on quality of care and ways to alleviate the side effects of hormonal therapy for prostate cancer. And it's also supported our own work on bioengineering and the creation of a circulating tumor cell chip to detect blood, uh, cancer cells in the blood of patients with cancer, something which is now one of our great success stories. The past 25 years have witnessed exponential growth for our cancer center, from being the new kids on the block to emerging as a national leader in targeted therapies, tumor genetic analysis, and integration of multidisciplinary care across our disease centers. And for the next 25 years, with your help and the help of everybody around here, we have great ambitions to lead the way in integrating science with compassionate cancer care, bringing the very, the, the very excellence and breadth and scope of a place like MGH 
to solving cancer for our own and our children's generations. So let me conclude by expressing a very special thanks to Mike, not only for the generosity of yourself, the, generation, the generosity of the PCF towards MGH, but also for being such a powerful and articulate advocate for medical research throughout the world. This is a time of very serious need, and you've been incredible in pointing the way forward in such an insightful and powerful way.